Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The part of God's Word we'll consider together this evening is the first eight verses of the second half of the book of Isaiah, chapter 40. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice, one calling, in the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out, and I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. This is God's word. Please be seated. Dear Christian friends, a few days ago somebody asked me, are you ready for Christmas? And my response was not even close. But it started me to think, was it take to be ready for Christmas? Because of course we know that Christmas is far more than decorations and cards and cookies and parties. Christmas is more than worship services and sermons and Bible classes. Christmas really is a celebration. It's a celebration of life. And far too often, when people celebrate Christmas, they're disappointed because they celebrate the wrong thing. During the season of Advent, God would have us prepare. Prepare to celebrate when He came, to celebrate Christmas. But to celebrate Christmas because it's life, not just life here, but life eternal. And everything that God, that Jesus came to bring us, so that we'll be ready for when it comes again. The season of Advent, if you remember what the angel told Zechariah, what John the Baptist's job would be. He would turn the hearts of the parents to their children, and the hearts of the disobedient to the words of the righteous, to prepare a people for their God. That's how we get ready for Advent. And the first eight verses of the book of chapter 40, the book of Isaiah, are classic. It's a beautiful, grand illustration of God's promise. He starts out by saying, come. And he repeats it. Because this is a people who need it. This is a people who had been under attack. This is a people whose nation had been growing weaker and smaller year by year. This is a people who knew what suffering meant. They knew what the judgment of God was. And they needed comfort. And that message remains the same. God's people, all the people of this earth, need comfort. Because we know what it's like to live in a sinful world. We know what it's like to live in a world where disaster, disappointment, and rejection are common. We know what it's like to be alone. We know what it's like to be in pain. We know what it's like to despair. And God tells us that the message of Advent, the message of God, is comfort. He says, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her heart service has been completed. And you'll notice how prominent in these first few verses is the voice, the message. He says, speak to, your, speak to Jerusalem and proclaim to her. Tell them what they need 
to know. So during the season of Advent, we talk to each other. And the message that we have is not just Merry Christmas, or are you ready for Christmas yet, or did you know where the greatest sales are, or here's the latest recipe, or, you know, I got a good deal on some invitations. The message that we speak is a message of comfort. It's a message that says our heart service has been completed. And I think the greatest summary of that is the verse you know. And you know it's, it's, uh, it's reference. You know it's where it, where it occurs. Just in the three words, it is finished. We know that our Savior spoke those words on the cross. And we know why. He spoke those words because the work of redemption and salvation is done. Satan would still have us believe that there is more for us to do. Satan would have us believe that to make God happy, we have to work harder and faster. But the message of Advent is a message of forgiveness. It's not the message, God is coming, look busy. Coming, you're forgiven. Because we believe, we are ready. And that's a, that's a message of peace. Your, your sin has been paid for. That's the cross. That's the greatest message anyone can ever hear. She has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sin. This is not double punishment. This is a reward. And not just a reward. It's a reward that she can neither earn it nor deserve. It's forgiveness and life and peace now, and it's an eternity in heaven forever. It's comforting to know that we are in the hands of God, both now and for all eternity. It's comforting to know that when things are out of our control. I just went to see a man this afternoon who was going to meet his Lord soon. He knows that. We've been talking about it for weeks. In the last few days that I've visited him, it's been a one-sided conversation because he can no longer respond. And so the message that I brought to him was today's message. A message of comfort. That because Jesus already took care of all this, you're going home. And I'll see you there Not as soon as you go home, but it's where we're all going to because of what Jesus did. So how do we get ready for Christmas? How do we prepare during the season of Advent? Everything that we do, whether it's the cards we pick or whether it's the ornaments we choose or whether it's the decorations that we, that we uh, use to celebrate the season, has the same message. It's not a message about a cute little baby. It's not a message about a fat man who wears red. It's not a message about satisfying people's greed. It's a message of forgiveness and comfort and peace. And we speak that message. We tell people that message. And of course we recognize in verse 3, this is a reference to John the Baptist, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. John, of course, preached in a real desert. We preach in a metaphorical one. Because we live in a country where the Word of God is rare. We live in a country where worship is not encouraged. We live in a place where the Word of God is mostly unknown. And so it's a desert. And in that desert, he says, we want to make straight the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord. Let people know clearly this is what the Lord says. 
Let's not confuse them with the incidentals. Let's not confuse them by giving them three or four different messages during Christmas. Let's just focus on the one. Jesus is the reason for the season. There is no other reason. It's not because this is the season of the year where the stores make one third of their profit. This is not the reason. The, the reason for the season is not this is where the economy makes it or it tanks. It's about Jesus. Make that straight. Make that clear. In the way that you speak with your family, in the way that you speak with your friends, in the way that you make preparations in your home, make straight in this wilderness a highway for our God. Because Jesus came to change things. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. I was loving Luther's explanation of this. Uh, he says that regardless of whether you are in the clergy or whether you are uh, the, the, the worst sinner out there, you need the same thing. The only way home is Jesus. And so for both the proud will be brought low, the humble will be brought up. But we're all brought to the same place. We're all brought to the foot of the cross where our salvation and our peace is found. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places of a plain. Because we're no longer struggling to make it through life on our own, we're walking with our God. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see. The angels who shared the message with the, the shepherds on that first day, all the way down through all the generations to us. Whether it's the children in the Christmas Eve program uh, preaching the gospel and sharing the message of Jesus Christ who came to save. Or whether it's the Christmas cards that we send, or whether it's the message that, that is heard from the pulpit, that people can see their Savior. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And that's really where it gets its authority. Because this is what God says. How do we know Jesus is coming back? God says so. How do we know my sins are forgiven? Because you know there's some days it doesn't feel like it. Because God said so. How do we know that I am not going to be alone in anything? Because God said so. How do I know it's going to be okay? Because God said so. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. And so he says to us, cry out. Well, the voice says cry out, and we say, well, what do I cry? How many of us can relate to that? Go make disciples of all nations. What do I say? Always be prepared to give an answer to those who ask you about the hope that you have. What do I say? What words do I use? I don't want to make it worse. So what do I say? And you notice what he says here. He says, this is what you say. All men are like grass, and their glory is like the flowers of the field. Really? I should put that on my Christmas cards. All men are like grass. You know, who's going to get that? The grass withers and the flowers fall. Recognize that what God is telling us through the, through the message of Isaiah is that Christmas will not, cannot be appreciated or understood without the message of the law. Most people believe that they are just fine the way they are. And that they don't really need a Savior. They don't really need worship. They don't really need a relationship with their God. Because after all, they're good people. Relatively. They're not perfect, but after all, no one is. And what he says is the first thing that people need to understand is that we are not okay before our God. Without Christ, we like grass. And the breath of the Lord blows on them, and they're gone. That's our situation. And that's the difference between when we look in the manger, and we see that our Savior, who has come to rescue us, or 
we see a cute little baby who would look really nice on a Christmas tree. It's the difference between Christmas being a celebration of life and another excuse for fun. It's the difference between thinking that what I need for Christmas is the forgiveness of my persistent and pervasive sin or a new car or the latest electronic gadget that's out there. Or something else shiny and bright and new and preferably expensive. What do I need for Christmas? When we understand that all people are like grass, then we begin to understand I need a Savior. Because the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the Word of our God stands forever. The word of our God is what we need to hear. The word of our God is how we prepare. The word of our God is what Advent is about. How do we turn the hearts of the parents to their children? How do we turn the hearts of the, of the sinners to their God? It's the word of our God. In our moment, especially during Advent, read the word of God together. Especially when we are making an effort to prepare for the return of our Savior. Make the Word of God common in your home. Whether you read it, whether you memorize it, whether you recite it together, or whether you use it for worship, the Word of your God stands forever. And in the Word of our God, we find strength and comfort and peace and joy. Joy that's everlasting. Joy that's for the whole world because it's about Jesus. And what we need for Christmas, how we prepare for Christmas, it's Jesus and only Jesus. Amen. The peace of God Transcend all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. During the first verse, or during the offering, uh, we ask that you would take the friendship register that's on the inside of the big pew. Oh, I skipped that so much. Yeah. And then you would fill those out, and then you would share that with someone with whom you were worshiping this evening. 